Okay, so let me welcome you to our last lecture. Congratulations for making it so far. Uh, we are going to uh, give an overview of the entire course. Uh, we're going to go through a number of topics uh, in the order that we cover them in class. So we started off with uh, Alpha Zero, an amazing program. And also we talked about some related programs uh, and uh, we use this as a motivating application, uh, trying to understand its methodology and also to generalize it to a far broader context. We mentioned that it involves uh, two algorithms, really. One is uh, the offline training process by which it learns how to play. And the other one is the algorithm by which it actually plays against uh, real opponents, real or computer opponents. And uh, we made the point that uh, these two algorithms are related to fundamental algorithms in dynamic programming. So we discussed dynamic programming for finite horizon problems first. Then we gave uh, the theory of infinite horizon problems in summary, and then later in more detail. And uh, uh, we discussed uh, the ideas of approximation involved in approximate dynamic programming in value space and policy space, and how these connect with offline training and online play. Then um, we talked about rollout. We spent quite a bit of time on rollout and its variations, first for deterministic problems and then for stochastic problems. Um, we, we discussed a more difficult case of uh, rollout, which involves infinite control spaces. And uh, uh, we discussed ways to, um, to deal with those using optimization heuristics, and in particular, uh, we discussed the context of model predictive control, a uh, very important methodology in control systems design. Then we talked about multi-agent problems, where the control consists of multiple components. And um, we discussed how we deal with those with one agent at a time computations. Um, this subject uh, involves recent research. Uh, my research over the last year and a half, we spent quite a bit of time on it and uh, we gave some case studies around it. Um, the, then the preceding topics deal primarily with offline, of, with online play. Now offline training is done usually with parametric approximation architectures and neural networks in particular. And we discuss how we use neural networks within this context, how we train them and so on. Then we went on in more detail to infinite horizon problems and uh, discussed the theoretical properties and also how they connect to approximations. A fundamental algorithm is policy iteration. And we discussed uh, how we construct approximate versions of that. Then we talked about a fundamentally different type of method involving approximation in policy space, talked about gradient methods, random search, and so on. And then we closed with aggregation as we did in the previous lecture. So I'm going to take all these topics one at a time. And uh, I'm going to be pausing once in a while for questions. You can ask any questions about anything and everything. And, uh, uh, and then I, and then you may interrupt me also if there's something that you want to interject. So uh, let's go to Alpha Zero. Um, it came up a few years ago and created uh, quite a bit of interest. And uh, there was a, a, pr a program before that called Alpha Go that, uh, that uh, uh, could play uh, uh, the game of Go at a superhuman level. Um, 25 years before that, there was another program that played backgammon. It goes by the name of TD Gammon or other related uh, names by Tesoro. And it created similarly a lot of interest and motivated a lot of work in, in reinforcement learning. 
And these two programs fundamentally use the same kind of ideas. The ideas of offline training, online play, apportions, policy duration, rollout, and the like. Now, as I mentioned, it's important to understand there are two types of algorithms around uh, these programs. One is offline training, which uh, represents the learning process by which the program learns how to play. In particular, it pre-computes value and policy approximations, and also other useful quantities that may be, they may be useful some, some context later. Uh, and then another algorithm, which is the algorithm that actually plays against human or computer opponents. And this is a different kind of algorithm. It involves multi-step look ahead, roll out, uh, and uh, uh, it involves also the pre-computed value and policy approximations obtained during training. So that's how these two types of algorithms connect. Offline training computes some very some useful quantities that uh, uh, that that are used in actual play. So now this process here has strong connections with dynamic programming. And the principal ideas involved are rollout. How, given a policy, we compute a new policy by look ahead minimization that has improved properties. Policy iterations are fundamental algorithm in infinite horizon dynamic programming and involves a repeated rollout, one rollout after another, switching the new policy with the old policy. Then there's the policy improvement principle. Every new policy within this context here performs better than the preceding one. It's a fundamental property in policy iteration. That's what makes policy iteration work. Then there are approximation with all these because, uh, because we're looking at challenging problems where exact versions of these ideas will not, are, not, uh, um, are not feasible. Uh, so we use approximations to deal with the curse of dimensionality too much computation, too large dimension. And uh, the, uh, uh, the approximations come into uh, value space approximating cost functions and policy space approximating policies. And uh, uh, we may use uh, a variety of approximation architectures, but neural network is the one that we emphasize the most. Now, this course, has a focus and a point of view. It starts out from alpha zero and it tries to develop, to extend and to unify all the underlying methodology so that it applies far more generally. It applies to general dynamic programming applications such as those appearing in, for example, in operations research in industrial engineering, uh, optimal control, including the methodology of model predictive control, uh, topics in robotics and planning, multi-agent problems, uh, combinatorial optimization, deterministic integer programming type of problems, uh, decision and control in a changing environment when the date of the problem changes as you control the system, uh, which comes under the name of adaptive control. All of these ideas connect around all of these applications in a unified way, and that's the point of view that we want to emphasize that we emphasize in this course. So now let me go into uh, the the offline training of Alpha Zero and also Alpha Go and the backgammon program. Uh, the method of policy iteration is used, but with approximations and self-generated data. Uh, the current policy we call a player, it's a player. It uh, plays games, given a position generates a move to play. And uh, the current player is used to train an improved player. And uh, uh, this is done by two neural networks. One evaluates the performance of the current player. This is the value network. In other words, the current player plays a lot of games and we collect the, the 
performance in the evaluation of the position that it generates, and uh, we fit a neural network to that. Then uh, we use a policy improvement operation and on playing state uh, position and move pairs, and we represent uh, this process with a policy network. Uh, and this gives us the improved layer that, um, uh, or what we call improved, we hope that it's improved. And uh, we repeat, the new player starts in the place of the current player and we keep going, generate a sequence of players. Now the successive neural networks are trained using this self-generated data, but playing games. And we use least squares and methods that uh, we discussed later. And uh, the um, backgammon uh, uh, game, uh, which as I said, dates back to the nineties, has a similar structure, but uses only a value network. Basically the value network uh, evaluates uh, the positions, a position evaluator, and uh, it also serves as a substitute to a policy network by look ahead minimization. In other words, by looking forward one step or two steps uh, with this uh, value network, we generate uh, moves and these moves are the ones that uh, we use online for various processes of, uh, of look ahead minimization and, and, and roll out. So uh, sometimes we use two uh, networks, sometimes one, the policy, the value network is essential. The policy network uh, may be dispensed with at the expense of alternative calculations. Okay, now the value network and policy network that we obtain from offline training is used in online play. In particular, the general structure is the following. At the current position, be it chess or go or backgammon, we uh, generate a look ahead tree of moves and counter moves. And then from the leaves of the tree, we run the policy network forward a number of steps. And at the end, uh, we approximate the effect of future moves by using the a position evaluator. In other words, the value network. So um, now these three programs use slightly different uh, configurations of this, uh, uh, vari variations of this figure. For example, alpha, alpha zero does not have the middle part, okay? It does not do rollout, but it uses a very long look ahead. Um, alpha go uses the middle part. Uh, TD, uh, the TD gammon or the rollout version uses all of those in the way that uh, you see them here. One difference of alpha zero and alpha go from the TD gammon player and other players is that it uses also Monte Carlo tree search to do this uh, look ahead minimization. Um, the details are a little different, but the structure is the same. This is our fundamental structure. Some piece may be missing, some piece may be, pieces may be slightly modified, but this is our structure. And this involves online play. This involves online play and perhaps offline training if we use a pre-trained policy network. This part involves offline training. So the offline uh, stuff that we have learned is used to play in real time. Okay, so let's go now into dynamic programming and uh, for infinite, for finite horizon problems. Our basic mathematical model for finite horizon problems, you see it here, it involves a dynamic system whose state is xk at time k. The system runs from time zero to time capital N for finite horizon problems. The control is no uk. WK is a random disturbance with given probability distribution. For deterministic problems, there is no random disturbance and that makes, uh, makes the situation easier and also provides, provides us with a few more algorithmic options. Now with this transition from XK to XK plus one, according to this equation, there's a cost that's generated that's random because of the presence of WK and the, over cost, the overall cost over 
an n-step system trajectory is the sum of the stage cost plus a terminal cost. Now this is a random variable because wk is random. So we take the expected value of that and this is the number that we want to minimize. Now we are looking for policies, sequences of functions of state. Each mu k is a, a closed loop control law. It's a function of xk or a list if you'd like for every xk at time k, it gives us the control that we should apply. And uh, there are many of these policies and we want to find an optimal policy. Now the cost of a policy is given by this number here. We plug in this mu k's, uh, and this is a number for a given policy and depends on the initial state. So the cost is a function of the initial state for every policy. And we want to find the optimal cost by minimization over all policies. This is a function of the state and it's one of the main objects of interest. This is the most important uh, quantity in the entire uh, optimization problem. Okay, we've gone through this in great detail and repeatedly and uh, uh, there's a dynamic programming algorithm that uh, addresses this problem optimally exactly. Uh, it produces the optimal costs of the tail sub problems that start at xk. In other words, we start at xk, we disregard whatever happened in the past, and we look forward to the end, and we obtain a certain cost that depends on xk. Uh, and uh, the algorithm generates these jk stars backwards, starting from the terminal uh, cost. Uh, and uh, this is jn star, this is trivially the, the cost of the trivial and sub, tail sub problem. And given the, the optimal cost of all the tail sub problems starting at time k plus one, it generates the optimal cost of all the tail sub problems starting at time k. And as we go back from n to n minus one to zero, at time zero, we generate the optimal cost. By definition, j star is the optimal cost of the tail sub problem that starts at x0. So that's the dynamic programming algorithm. Now, once we have carried out this algorithm, which is of course quite formidable, and we have obtained this optimal uh, finite horizon costs, j1 star up to jn star, in, in online play, in real time operation, we generate controls going forward. We observe the current state xk, and we do this minimization over all u that satisfy the constraint. We minimize the, the right-hand side of this equation uh, involving the first stage cost plus the optimal cost to go from the next state. So once we have this j stars, we can, we can go forward and generate controls. On the other hand, the problem is that uh, this is not so easy because J star is very hard to calculate. That's the principal impediment. We also have to compute this expected value, which may be time consuming. We also have to do this minimization, which may also be time consuming. So these are the basic issues that preclude exact dynamic programming to be for, uh, from being a general purpose, widely useful tool. To make dynamic programming a, a tractable, useful uh, methodology, we have to introduce approximations. There is no way around that. And the principal approximation is to replace this J star, which is the most onerous, the most difficult to compute. We replace it with some J tilde K. And there are a number of ways of um, calculating this J tilde K that we have gone through in great detail. There are also the other issues of approximating possibly the expected value here. Of course, this does not arise in deterministic problems, but in stochastic problems, this can be difficult. We may consider doing approximations and this minimization over U. What we have called the three approximations and these three approximations have to be dealt with and, uh, and fortunately they can be dealt with more or less independently of each other. Uh, 
another point worth noting here is that this process of, ex of generating the exact optimal solution also involves offline training to obtain these J stars and also real time implementation or online play going forward to obtain a UK star. So even in the exact version of the algorithm, there's offline training and online play conceptually. This conceptual distinction is going to be, uh, is going to be carried over to approximations as we have seen. Okay, so what is uh, done for finite horizon extends to infinite horizon problems. The, the basic ideas are the same, but the mathematicals are more complicated. We have not gone too much into the mathematics, but uh, generally speaking, excuse me. Generally speaking, there are three theorems in infinite horizon problems that you look for, okay? We have focused on problems involving discounting and also problems involving um, stochastic shortest path problems involving a finite number of states. But infinite horizon problems can come into a far broader variety, but there are always the three theorems that you want to look at. And the first theorem has to do with whether the finite horizon optimal costs converge to the infinite horizon optimal cost as the horizon goes to infinity. In other words, if you consider the k stages problem, okay, and let j k of x be the optimal cost of that finite horizon problem, starting from state x, then the theorem says that j stars of x, the optimal infinite horizon cost is equal to the limit as k goes to infinity of the finite horizon cost for all states X. And this is true for the problems that we consider in this class, discounted and stochastic shortest paths for the finite number of states under some assumptions. Um, but I'm putting here the question mark to indicate that you should be careful that if you go to more general problems, this is not taken for granted. You should not take this for granted. The second theorem has to do with Bellman's equation. J star satisfies this equation, a functional equation, one equation for its state X, almost always it holds, certainly for the problems that we have considered, but there are some freaky cases where this is not true. So, um, okay, that's another case where we have these question marks. The optimality condition holds, whereby once you have found J star by minimizing this Bellman equation, you obtain an optimal policy. And this is an if and only if statement. And it's certainly true for the problems that we have considered, the finite state problems of discount, discounted and stochastic shortest paths, but there are some exceptions. Okay, so from now on, we'll just take this for granted that they hold and uh, we'll worry later for cases where they don't hold, maybe in a different course. Um, Okay, so this is the theory, the basic theory, and now we have algorithms. And there are a few algorithms, the most basic of which are value iteration and policy iteration. Now, value iteration generates a sequence of, uh, of optimal cost functions, uh, but the difference here is that V0 is arbitrary, okay? And the, the kth iterate is obtained from the, uh, from the previous iterate according to this equation. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, note that alpha here is the discount factor. Okay, I should have mentioned that. Um, and uh, we expect this to converge to J star. Now the policy iteration algorithm is the one that we have used the most. Instead of generating values, a sequence of cost functions it generates sequences of policies, a sequence of policies and uh, their corresponding cost functions. These are stationary policies, okay? Applying the same UK for all times. K here refer refers not to state, but to iteration index. Start from an arbitrary initial policy, generate a policy mu one, then mu two and so on. 
And this is done in a two-stage process. The typical iteration starts with a policy mu, generates a new policy mu tilde in two steps. Policy evaluation step, which computes the cost function of this policy mu, and the policy improvement step, which computes an improved policy using the one-step look-ahead minimization with j mu here in place of uh, the look-ahead function. And um, OK, so now uh, this algorithm in this exact form converges in a finite number of iterations and, in fact, converges very fast. Uh, and it can be viewed as Newton's method for solving Bellman's equation. It's an important interpretation uh, because, uh, uh, because it provides some insight into various variations, optimistic policy duration, uh, whereby um, the policy evaluation step is done approximately, typically using a few iterations of a few value iterations rather than an infinite number of value iterations or a full exact policy evaluation. This is optimistic. Um, there are, there's a simplified variance where this minimization is simplified. It's a multi-agent variant, which we have talked about and we'll talk about a little later. And there are also Q learning versions of policy iteration. So policy iteration comes in several different forms and the, in its exact form, it can be viewed as Newton's method converges very fast. The variations do not have some limitations, but they, they retain a lot of the favorable convergence properties of policy iteration. Rollout is just the first iteration of policy iteration. The full-fledged policy iteration requires a lot of computation. Rollout is a lot simpler. It's just a single iteration, and it's a simpler iteration. However, it is still a Newton iteration, making it pretty fast. And this manifests itself in the fact that from mu zero, we obtain mu one, and mu one is already a pretty good policy. Great, policy, great uh, improvement in performance from the very first iteration. It's a Newton iteration, particularly if you're close to optimum, it in fact it converges as single. It, it gives you the exact optimal policy you can prove. Okay, so we have algorithms, value iteration and policy iteration. These are exact. And now we have approximate versions of policy iteration, which uh, are very close to the heart of this uh, course. Uh, here we generate a sequence of policies and from the current policy, which we call base policy, we generate a lot of data about its performance. We represent this by a value network, which gives you an approximate cost function of the policy. So this approximate policy evaluation, and then we generate, uh, we generate through a policy improvement process, uh, policy data and represent the new policy by a policy network. So from a base policy, we generate a rollout policy and we keep going. And this, the approximation is done with, uh, with uh, value and policy networks, possibly neural networks. Now, it's important to note that this is offline training. There is no policy iteration algorithm going beyond a single policy that is online play. It's always offline training, which means you train neural networks for hours and days and weeks and so on, and then you obtain this data to be used for online play. Now, rollout is just the first iteration of, of, of policy iteration and can be done in online uh, play fashion in online fashion. And as I mentioned earlier, rollout typically improves substantially the base policy. And that's because you're applying Newton's method for one step and Newton's method is a very powerful method. That's the best explanation that I can give you. Okay. So now let's uh, go into approximation in value and policy space in general, not just through policy iteration, but in general. By the way, are there any questions so far? Can I, do you have any questions? 
If we have a problem that requires system identification, um, would methods for system identification be considered a third type of algorithm, kind of alongside the algorithms for offline and online play? Or would we group those together and modify our offline algorithms? Nothing that we have covered in this class deals with, with, with system identification. Right, Another yeah, one. understood. So, okay. If you want to do simultaneously system identification and control, you would have to pass into a far more complicated model that involves the unknown system parameters involved in some kind of initial condition. And uh, then it would be a problem with imperfect state information and extremely complicated and with pit pitfalls that have been considered since uh, for the last uh, 50 or 60 years and still we, we, are, we are struggling to deal with them. Um, the, uh, the closest we came to considering system identification within our context is through a process of uh, adaptive control and online replanning. In other words, you may have a system identification algorithm running in the background. And once in a while, this algorithm gives a model to the controller or to the rollout uh, player and then online, through online replanning, uh, the controller uses the new model that the system identifier provides. But in our context, the system identifier is not coupled uh, with the control process. It simply runs in the background uh, using its own data. And then uh, uh, once in a while, it provides a model for the online player to use. Does this answer your question? Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, so this is a familiar figure. It refers to approximation value space and it deals with online play after offline training, okay? And it generates controls at a given state. You are the XK and generates controls by this minimization involving the first stage cost and the future costs as represented by an approximation J tilde. Okay, there are three approximations involved here. And uh, the most important one is this J tilde. This is obtained to a great extent through offline training. Uh, however, not necessarily, uh, but for the most part. Um, for example, you may use problem approximation, whereby you take a related but simpler problem to the one that you are given, solve it exactly offline, and then use the results for online play in this approximation in value space scheme. Another possibility is uh, through parametric approximation. You have a neural network to train it or some other approximation activity, train it with over days and weeks, and then you get used to J tildes and you use online in this scheme. Uh, aggregation is a form of problem approximation. Finally, there is rollout, which involves a mixture of offline uh, training and online play. Uh, sometimes you do online simulation, sometimes you use terminal cost approximation. Model predictive control is uh, similar to rollout. It's a special case, in fact. So there are many, many different methods in this, uh, in this uh, category here. And uh, most of reinforcement learning, in fact, deals with how you approximate J tilde. Um, however, there are other issues that are important. How do you make this expectation, the calculation of this expectation cheaper? One possibility is um, to make this expression deterministic. Uh, okay, the source of uncertainty here, the source of stochasticity is this random variable WK. If you replace this WK with a deterministic quantity, which is called certainty equivalence, then the issue of expectation disappears. And there are also other related concepts whereby for some controls you use more exact or less exact simulation, depending on which control is more promising than the other. Monte Carlo research is based on that idea. Some controls you spend more 
simulation budget with in some other controls uh, you you spend less simulation uh, less less simulation effort approximate minimization for example the minimization here may be over continuous space you may want to do it approximately by discretizing the continuous space or you may want to do some kind of simplification whereby you throw away some controls that are judged to be non-promising multi-agent minimization one agent at a time is a form of simplification so there are a few different options here depending on your problem structure moreover this represents one step look ahead you can also do multi-step look ahead whereby you minimize over the cost of the first l steps and then the future as represented by the approximation j tilde and then you obtain a sequence a control plus a sequence of uh, of, of of control functions and you use only uk and not the others and uh, the three approximations uh, also arise within this context this tends to perform better intuitively the reason is you treat more of your cost exactly okay through exact minimization exact representation less of the cost approximately roughly speaking this is the reason why you get a better performance typically by multi-step look ahead uh, although theoretically but through artificial examples you can show that it's not necessarily true that by increasing the length of the look ahead you obtain a better uh, suboptimal policy i think we gave one example like that in one of our lectures okay so now let's look at the other type of approximation uh, we covered approximation in value space and there's also the possibility of approximation in policy space obtain a policy which is approximately optimal now this is strictly offline okay you it's not a good idea to do approximation in policy space only uh in 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 in, in a real application in online play there are a number of reasons for this <clears throat> However, you can use approximation in policy space as to provide some to provide some information, some data that can be used in approximation in value space. In other words, uh, it can be used as a component of uh, approximation in value space. Okay. So here, the basic formulation is one whereby we have a, a parameterization of the policies with a parameter vector rk for the case of a, a finite horizon problem rk depends on the stage for the case of an infinite horizon problem there's only one set of parameters for the stationary policy mu and we plug this in here for a given value of rk and uh, it uh, it provides um, uh, it provides uh, generates costs okay the system runs there's a cost associated with every uh, parameter set and we optimize uh, the parameters by minimizing the corresponding cost so the restricted class is usually a parametric uh, family of uh, policies like that uh, rk is a parameter for example a neural network is one possibility but there are a lot of problem specific possibilities here and the training finding the optimal parameters within this restricted class can be done in a number of ways you can use classification software by um, by viewing controls uh, controllers as classifiers uh, that classify states into the controls to which they map you can use gradient optimization optimize the cost generated here over r or you can use random search there's a broad variety of methods and these methods don't have much to do with dynamic programming they are general machine learning methods rather than dynamic programming specific methods like policy approximate policy iteration or rollout now approximation policy space has a great advantage once you compute the the parameters rk the online computation of controls 
is often much faster. Basically, if you have an approximation architecture, which has been trained already, you look at the current state and it takes milliseconds, microseconds to generate the corresponding control. You don't have to do any cal complicated calculations. On the other hand, it has an important disadvantage. It does not allow for online replanning. Once you have a model and you have generated a controller for it through approximation in policy space, if the data of the problem changes, that controller may do crazy things. It was trained for something different, okay? On the other hand, approximation in value space with or without a policy space component is well suited for all online replanning, even with off online, offline computation J tilde, because you take into account the changed data in the online minimization of uh, current stage cost plus future uh, cost to go. Um, another disadvantage that approximation in policy space has, it does not take, it does not benefit of the bump in performance obtained through rollout. In approximation in value space in the previous figure, if this is the cost of a given policy, the, the, the policy that you generate is a rollout policy which has improved, improved performance. Approximation in policy space by itself cannot provide that bump, that increase, that, that improvement in performance. Okay, but approximation in policy space is all is needless to say, however, that it's a very important part of the RL methodology and uh, it plays an important role, although you may use it in, uh, in, in ways that are better or worse. Okay, so I've emphasized this online versus offline computation scheme. It's an important conceptual scheme. And I'd like to, to, to view it once, one more time. Here's the familiar figure with the three approximations and approximation in value space. There are partly offline methods uh, where these J tildes are completely computed for every K before the control process begins. So there's a long offline training process in these methods. And examples of those are neural network and uh, other parametric approximations to compute J tilde, also aggregation. At the other end, there are mostly online methods where J tilde is not computed completely at, for all states at any point. The, J, the values are computed only at the relevant next states that maybe that will be encountered uh, as, uh, we, as we generate controls online. Uh, so only the necessary J tilde values are used to compute, to compute this control here at each one of the end time steps. And examples of methods that are mostly offline are rollout and model predictive control. Now they may contain an offline component, particularly if you use cost function, terminal cost function approximation in truncated rollout and similarly for model predictive control. But mostly and fundamentally the methods are online. These are offline primarily, and these are offline, uh, online primarily. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, let me go into rollout and its variations. We separate the treatment of rollout into two parts, deterministic and stochastic. Deterministic uh, rollout is more effective and also uh, it provides a few more options. Let me describe deterministic rollout in this pure form. We generate states and at the current state we look at all possible controls and the corresponding state, the single unique state that is generated by application of these controls. 
and we calculate a Q factor obtained by running some heuristic, any heuristic, from this state all the way to the end. This heuristic only has the property that it can complete a trajectory. Given a trajectory up to here, it can run a completion in some way. It can be very intelligent or very stupid. However, uh, in principle, uh, anything will do. And uh, we generate these Q factors here, first stage cost plus the cost of the heuristic, starting from the next state. And we compare these Q factors and choose the control that has the minimal Q factor. We move to the next state, XK plus one, and then generate again all the controls, run the heuristic from each one of the possible next states, and, uh, and continue. There's also multi-step look ahead versions and other versions that we're going to discuss. Because the problem is deterministic here, you can afford to do multi-step look ahead because the, the branching factor of the look, up look ahead tree is, is smaller. It does not blow up with uh, the branching factor of the random disturbance. And uh, so deterministic problems are, have important advantage when it comes to rollout over stochastic problems. Okay, now still um, deterministic rollout can be time consuming. So we have um, a version that involves a truncated rollout uh, and terminal cost function approximation. And uh, the motivation is that long rollout is costly because the trajectory is to complete may be very long. Uh, in fact, if you have an infinite horizon problems, you cannot complete the trajectory. Uh, it's an infinite trajectory. Um, also, it's not, it's not theoretically clear why by increasing the length of the rollout, you're going to get improved performance. In fact, some experiments and some analysis show that the length of the rollout should be some kind of a compromise, uh, some, some kind of a trade-off between length of computation and improvement in performance. And uh, one should, uh, for each problem, one should experiment to find the right length of uh, rollout. Now, to compensate for truncation of the rollout, we use a terminal cost function approximation, uh, which, uh, which accounts for the cost of the remaining stages and also allows combinations with offline training. The terminal cost function approximation may be obtained by offline training. Uh, for this scheme, we can prove various cost improvement properties uh, under various assumptions of sequential consistency, sequential improvement, and modifications like the fortified rollout algorithm, which guarantees cost improvement. And uh, I emphasize the point uh, that, in my view, there's no question that the rollout is the most reliable and most easily implementable reinforcement learning algorithm. A lot of these other, other algorithms that we're, we're, going, we're talking about, or other people are talking about, are flaky. Rollout will never betray you, it will always do good things for you. Sometimes uh, and a very substantial improvement over the, um, over the base policy. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and always some improvement. It is a very rare case where you don't get uh, you don't get good results from rollout, but you never get bad results, particularly if you use things like fortified rollout and so on. Still, however, if you're aiming to solve a difficult problem, you need to do some trial and error experimentation. Okay, now we spend a lot of time on rollout. Remember, this is not a general course in reinforcement learning. It was targeted towards rollout and approximate policy iteration in multi-agent problems. So we discussed a lot of different variations of rollout. One of them is a fortified rollout for deterministic problems, which guarantees cost improvement. Basically, you, you generate a sequence of trajectories and always maintain the best trajectory before switching to a new trajectory, you make sure that it, got, that it involves cost improvement. Uh, simplified rollout. Instead of minimizing over all Q factors, we minimize in over some Q factors. 
or we do um, some other kind of um, uh, uh, process like with multi-agent problems. Um, constrained rollout, where there are site constraints, trajectory constraints, we discussed that. Problems where you don't know a cost function, the cost function, but you have access to an expert that can rank two different trajectories uh, and can tell you which one is better. That's all you need in deterministic rollout. Rollout with continuous control space. Uh, I mentioned uh, about that uh, in the MPC. Multi-predictive control is an important example of, 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 uh, of versions of rollout that are adapted to continuous control space. Multi-agent rollout for problems with uh, uh, where the control has multiple components. Uh, we'll talk about those a little later again. Uh, there are combinations with Monte Carlo tree search, which affect this look ahead tree part. Uh, we do it uh, less precisely by emphasizing branches that are more likely to give you better uh, controls, better choices. Um, and uh, the, okay, the objective here is to save simulation time. Um, and uh, also combinations with approximations with value and policy space. Okay, uh, you need approximation in value space to, for this part here. And sometimes you need approximation in policy space because uh, you need to represent the control by which you do the rollout, represent it in some more, uh, in, in some uh, compact form. So all of this, uh, there are many, many variations and uh, uh, a lot of uh, interesting possibilities, both from the implementation point of view and sometimes from a theoretical point of view. Are there any questions on this slide that has so many methods on it? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I, I haven't thought about it for, for a while, so hopefully I phrase this right. But so for this deterministic case, we sample the the deterministic trajectories from all the next states. We're essentially computing the Q values, right? So the improvement properties are related to the contraction properties for that uh, Bellman operator, I would assume. So um, for the stochastic rollout, we're going to basically go and sample a number of these trajectories, do like a Monte Carlo estimate of our coup values. In that case, can you talk just a little bit about the bias and variance of stochastic rollout? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a handful of issues that you bring in. Uh, first of all, uh, contraction uh, properties uh, are relevant in the context of infinite horizon primarily. Uh, here we're talking about finite horizon problems as well as infinite horizon problems, but the focus here is mostly for finite horizon problems. I mean, a lot of these variations do not apply for infinite horizon. Um, so, so I think uh, I would say that uh, perhaps in some types of analysis, there may be a role for contraction mapping and type of theory, but not very much. Okay. Um, for deterministic problems, there's no issue of variance of uh, trajectory. We just generate the trajectory just as a single trajectory. For stochastic problems, however, uh, the results of cost improvement uh, assume that there is perfect simulation, an infinite number of samples to calculate the corresponding costs running from each one of these leaves to calculate it exactly. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of analysis and, and a lot of uh, algorithmic, um, uh, algorithmic uh, 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 variations uh, for variance reduction. In other words, suppose you're given a fixed budget of number of samples that you can use. You can structure the simulation so that you get, uh, you use your data efficiently and get small variance from your averaged estimate. Or you can do things 
let's say more naively, and then you may get large variance. The problem, the issue of variance reduction is a very important issue in simulation. Um, there is analysis like that in the literature in my reinforcement learning book. There is a section on that. However, in our class, we have skipped this completely. We didn't talk about it at all. Um, generally speaking, the layman's approach to variance reduction, you just compute more, more samples, you use more samples. But uh, there are some tricks that you can use and it, it would take me too long to explain them at this point. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, <laughs> what did I forget? Remind me, please. No, that was great. Thank you. I think you covered most of the points I brought up. So, okay, fine. Very good. Very good. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go into infinite control space problems. Um, okay, let's consider a uh, deterministic problem where the number of controls, however, is infinite. So you cannot enumerate all these Q factors and compare them. You have to do something different. And uh, we need a different implementation. And suppose, of course, one possibility is to discretize the control space, but then we may need an excessive number of Q factors. So we're looking for something a little different. And the major alternative is to use optimization heuristics. Remember that we generate all possible next states using all possible controls, and then we run a deterministic heuristic. Now, suppose that this heuristic is some kind of an optimization heuristic involving the choice of controls from this state to, to another L minus one stages, okay? And then you can combine this L minus one stages minimization with this first stage minimization to build an L stage, a single L stage deterministic optimization. And now this optimization, which will involve continuous control spaces, can be addressed with continuous spaces optimization techniques, like nonlinear programming or optimal control methods, quadratic programming, gradient type of methods, and so on. Now, this is the idea. Th this idea applies more generally to, um, to uh, linear programming, multi-stage linear programming problems, uh, a number of uh, interesting stochastic programming problems, uh, but we have not covered those in class. What we did go into was model predictive control. And uh, uh, we spend a lot of time, but here I have only one slide. Uh, model predictive control in its most basic form uh, involves deterministic control and to the origin, okay? Control problems come in two varieties. Either control a system to stay close to a certain reference point like the origin, or control the system so that it follows a certain trajectory. Now let's uh, discuss the case where we want to keep the system close to a given uh, reference point and, for, uh, and, and we take this to be the origin for specificity. Um, so the system is deterministic like so, and uh, the cost per stage is non-negative, except that the origin where we want the system to go and stay is cost-free and absorbing. So there's an incentive here to move towards the origin, which has minimum cost and continues to have minimum cost once you reach it. So that's a classical formulation, uh, optimal control formulation of the regulation problem. Now, there may be state constraints, like the state XK has to belong to a given set and control constraints. And this is really the most important thing. In model predictive control, we are trying to address constraints like that more effectively than we would with unconstrained formulations, like the linear quadratic formulation that we have discussed uh, at various points in the class. Uh, model predictive control deals better with state and control constraints. And what it does at state XK, it solves an L-step look ahead version of the problem, requiring that after L steps, 
the state is the optimal state zero. Okay. And uh, the costs here are the same as for so this is what it computes is a is a legitimate uh, op control sequence go to zero and then stay at zero, and it solves this problem. In this way, it will obtain a sequence of L controls, one stage and then L minus one stages. It keeps the control of the first stage throws away the remaining of the controls and then goes to the next state and just does the same thing. Another problem, L steps ahead, keep the first control, throw away the others and so on. Now, model predictive control is a very broad subject. There are quite a few books written on it. Uh, there are many, many variations. It's still a subject of ongoing uh, intensive research and there are many variations. One is instead of aiming to, in this, in this heuristic optimization, L-step minimization, instead of trying to go exactly to the origin, we introduce a terminal cost function approximation. And under some condition, like a, like a sequential improvement type of condition or Lyapunov condition, as it's called in control, uh, you can uh, prove that the overall system is stable. By the way, the main advantage of this of, of this formulation here with uh, driving the state to zero is that it produces a stable controller, okay? That's a major result in MPC. And this property is maintained with a terminal cost function approximation under a certain condition of the sequential improvement type. Um, there are issues having to do with how, how do you keep satisfying these constraints? For example, the control that you calculate within this um, uh, with this minimization may be such that it's good if you just focus on this L-step minimization, but it may drive you to parts of the state space where it is impossible not to violate. It's impossible to maintain uh, this state constraint. So there's a whole lot of uh, reachability of target cubes type of methodology to obtain, uh, uh, to obtain, to modify these constraints so that, uh, so that uh, they can be maintained at all times using this, uh, this heuristic minimization. There are simplified versions like multi-agent versions of uh, MPC, and uh, there are others uh, involving both continuous spaces, mixture of discrete uh, variables, district, discrete control variables and continuous control variables, where this problem here becomes an integer programming problem, may be difficult to solve, and there's, there's lots of stuff here. Okay, so I'm going to spend some time with multi-agent problems, remind you of the basic uh, ideas. And then uh, we're going to conclude our discussion of approximation in value space. And we're going to go into approximation in policy space and other related, uh, in, not, well, in offline, we're going to look at offline uh, training type of algorithms. And I'm going to switch also to a video from the 2019 uh, offering of the class. So let's look at multi-agent problems, which is a, a problem at the cutting edge, edge of research. I mean, this problems, at least in the approach that I have discussed here uh, is only about one and a half year old. Uh, still, however, uh, enough research has been generated and enough case studies have been produced to suggest its reliability and effectiveness. Uh, using the idea of one agent, uh, uh, one agent control calculation at a time. Okay, you've seen this figure before, uh, represented uh, it's, it's a general uh, uh, schematic uh, of uh, multi-agent problems. We have uh, this decision-making centers, each one involving its own control, U1, U2, and so on. And uh, there is uh, an, an environment, uh, the agents exchange information that they obtain through sensors among each other, and they exchange information from the environment. And, um, and each agent, given the information that it possesses, applies decision, it applies a decision. So agent I applies decision UI, 
sequentially in discrete time. And uh, the overall control is the Cartesian product of these U's, okay? It's the M tuple for M agents is M components of control. Um, now, a major distinction, mathematical distinction between different problems, which was well known 50 years ago, uh, is that there are problems involving a classical information pattern where all the agents are fully cooperative, fully sharing and never forgetting information. And this is relatively easy because it can be treated by dynamic programming. And the other one is uh, the case, the non-classical case, where the agents may not be fully sharing information, may be antagonistic. Uh, <clears throat> the environment may be sending information intermittently. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, deviations from the classical information pattern. And these problems are extremely hard to address, even conceptually, because uh, they cannot be treated by dynamic programming. They're optimization problems, but but very unstructured. In, in particular, they cannot be treated by dynamic programming. So our approach here has been to look at problems where the classical information pattern holds uh, exact state information, perhaps exact belief state information for the case of um, a POM DP. Um, and uh, the agents choose their controls as function of the states and they all share the same information, the same state. So it's like having a information cloud here that collects all the information and then passes on to the agent all the information that they need from a dynamic programming point of view. Now we adopt a stochastic dynamic programming problem, finite or infinite horizon, state X, control U, and the characteristic aspect of this problem is that the control has M components corresponding to the M agents. Now, agents here is just a metaphor. Um, it may be that you have M agents spread all over the Phoenix metropolitan area, or you may have M agents uh, housed uh, within a single computer. Uh, the important mathematical structure is multiple components. And uh, uh, we aimed here at faster computation. There's a major problem here uh, involving the size of the control space. Because the control has multiple components, the size of the control space grows exponentially with M, the number of agents. So in our approach, we have dealt with this exponential size explosion of the search space with one agent at a time computations, like minimizations, minimizations in the context of approximation in value space. And in the case where we are in the non-classical information pattern uh, situation, or to further accelerate the computation, we use signaling, information that uh, estimates uh, information consisting of estimates of what we don't quite know exactly. And this signaling is pre-computed using neural networks or other estimators. We have seen examples of that, but exactly how signaling is pre-computed is also a problem related issue. So classical information pattern, and whenever we deviate from that, we use signaling and bring in neural networks or other kinds of estimators. And I will give you again the basic structure involving the infinite horizon case. This is simplifying notation. The same thing applies for finite horizon. And the standard rollout operation with a, with a given policy mu, with a base policy mu, um, is to do this minimization over all M tuples of controls. The multi-agent rollout case does this minimization one U component at a time. It's a form of simplified rollout where we don't do exact minimization. We do it approximately, but in a way that's intelligent. 
And the remarkable thing about multi-agent rollout, it is still guarantees cost improvement. Um, and the way it operates is um, it breaks up this minimization into M minimizations over a single agent at a time. The first agent does this minimization over its own component, assuming that the future agents use their uh, base policy. The second agent assumes, does this minimization, assuming that the future agents will use the base policy, but the third preceding agent uses the controls already computed in the previous stage, the rollout control, in other words. Similarly, every agent computes by minimization over its own control, assuming that the future agents will use the base policy, the past agents use the rollout policy. And finally, we reach the last agent, which assumes that all the preceding agents use the rollout controls and finds the last component. And this sequence of M minimizations provides you with a control to replace the control that you would get from this minimization here. Now, the search space of all these, uh, the, the, the amount of computation needed to do these operations here is linear in M and not exponential. And the speed up of force is enormous. And there are a number of, uh, of papers. Some of them have already been published. Others are, are in the process or in archive papers over the last year and a half. And also there are the case studies that we, there's a case study that we have discussed involving the uh, uh, multi-robot repair over a network um, gave a demonstration of that. Um, okay, so we also gave demonstrations and we used this spiders and flies example. Uh, just to repeat, here we have 15 spiders and uh, three flies. So the spiders move in the four directions or they may stay where they are. They have perfect vision. And they are the controllers, okay? Each one, each, each choice represents a component of control. The flies are blind, do not do anything purposely, uh, move randomly, and they provide the uncertainty for this problem. We could have also deterministic flies that don't move at all or move according to a known trajectory. And the objective is to catch the flies in minimum time. Now, okay, now the size of the control space is five to the 15. 15 spiders uh, and five choices each, approximately. It's an enormous number of joint move choices. So we have to compute five to the 15 Q factors here at each one stage to find the optimal joint move. Now with multi-agent rollout, this is reduced to just five times 15, 75 choices while maintaining the cost improvement property, as I will show in the next slide. So first spider makes a choice, sends its choice to every other spider. Then the second spider makes its choice, broadcasts its choice to the other spiders and so on. Now, we also gave an examples of pre-computed signaling implying coordination between the uh, spiders, where, which allows the 15 spiders to choose moves in parallel while guessing what the other spiders are going to do. And that can speed up the computation by up to 15, by a factor of 15 or whatever the number of, of, um, of uh, uh, agents is, spiders is. And uh, the, and perhaps, the use of signaling uh, uh, information uh, may deteriorate the performance of the overall scheme, but you can gain a lot in terms of computation, uh, in, terms, in terms of, um, of uh, speed up. So I know that one of you is doing a term project on spiders and flies. So when we discuss term projects in two weeks, um, we may hear some more about uh, this problem. Okay, finally, about multi-agent rollout. It's not really fundamentally uh, a new approach. It uh, involves 
at its heart, a reformulation to an equivalent problem. And this reformulation goes way back, 25 years back in my neurodynamic programming book with John Sickness. Uh, it involves a general approach for trading off state complexity with control complexity. Uh, so if the, if, if the control space bothers us and it's too big, we can trade it off with state complexity. And in the case of rollout, it's control complexity that kills us, that can make a big difference. State complexity is not so important because we never look at the entire state space. We only look at one state at a time. Okay, so what's this reformulation? We unfold the control action by making a transition from XK to XK plus one, breaking it up into M transitions, each one involving the selection of a single control by a single agent. And we move from this state to a composite state involving state and control. Then the second agent applies the control and we get a composite state involving two controls and so on. Up to, after M minus one choices, we reach this state here and the last agent chooses its control. And now we have the complete joint control vector and we, um, and we can make a transition according to the system equation to XK plus one with this cost. All these other transitions involve no cost. And so this problem is equivalent. It really doesn't make a difference whether you have, uh, you're, you're selecting all controls at once or one at a time, as long as all, all agents know the exact value of the state XK. Uh, the control space is simplified because it's only one at a time with a, a lot less Q factors overall, but there are some additional layers of state involving this intermediate states here. And multi-agent rollout is just standard rollout for the reformulated problem. And you can see here the similarities involving one control choice at a time, taking into account the current state, which, improve, which involves the previous choices of controls. And the increase in size of state space does not bother us because there's only one state per stage that's looked at for which we calculate Q factors during online play. And there's tremendous complexity reduction. So the key thing is that we maintain this, uh, uh, this uh, cost improvement property because after all, what we're doing is just standard rollout, which has the cost improvement property, but we just do it on a reformulated by equivalent problem. Okay. Are there any questions now before we go to the video from uh, the 2019 offering of the class and um, go into uh, questions of training, uh, offline training? Any questions? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Do, um, do we need to optimize or would it help op optimizing over the order of the agents? Like that seems like it should matter in general, right? Actually, it, it, you gain uh, you gain some improvement in performance by optimizing over the order. There are clever ways to optimize over the order, approximately, which uh, I'm not sure that the it's it's given in your class notes, but certainly given in the survey paper that um, I gave um, uh, I, I I noted earlier. So it does matter. The order does matter. Uh, because, okay, if you change the order of the agents, basically you're looking at a different reformulated problem, okay? And you're applying an approximation method on a different reformulated problem, and it's going to perform possibly differently. And there are other intuitive ways to explain it. I mean, you can okay. use like simple examples where the order matters. For example, if there's a control that's kind of dominant, okay, uh, relative to the others, it's a good idea to 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 pick that one in the right order. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and um, also, I was wondering, without knowing the full details of how the signaling is implemented, but can we uh, ever use the signaling to alleviate the need for knowing the dynamic model dynamics model of the environment? Because it seems like in uh, I was thinking about it before is 
that knowing the the current policy and what the other agents will do, we could use that to plan uh, ahead and see what states they'll land in. But it seems like the signaling is saying, no, we can actually do these moves in parallel. So is it possible to just do a model free version of this? Okay, if, mo if, by, if by model free, you mean that uh, we don't know a mathematical model, the answer is probably it's too difficult. The signaling, all the signaling theory is just very, very recent. We're talking about months now, okay? Uh, and uh, the, the, the range of applications of signaling within this context has not been fully explore, explored. So there may be something that you can do along the lines that you suggest, but I don't know of anything right now. Okay. And then also curiosity, do you know of any works that have tried to combine this with the aggregation schemes? Um, the answer is no, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are ways. Okay. Like I okay. said, all of this is very recent. Yeah. Not much has been done. I mean, I'm learning about it on a on a weekly basis, you know, people write to me and say, well, I have applied this and I have applied that. And I haven't even read all the things that they've written to me. Any other questions? Okay, so now we're going to go to the training of neural networks and the corresponding training of approximation architectures and other issues. And I'm going to use the video. Sure. Um, involves a parameter vector. Uh, it involves a class of functions parameterized by this parameter vector. It's multi-dimensional parameter. Uh, these components are called the weights. And the objective is to tune the weights, to use data to find proper, proper values of these weights so that the corresponding function approximates well your target function that you're trying to approximate. So we adjust R to change J tilde and match the cost function approximated. And we do this by training the architecture. The training algorithm is the algorithm that you choose to, that you use to choose R. And um, there are many different types of training algorithms, but the most common is to use data, input, output pairs that you match with uh, the approximation architecture using some kind of quadratic regression. Now, these architectures can be linear or nonlinear, depending on whether the dependence on R is linear or nonlinear. Um, also, typically, architectures are feature-based. Uh, they depend on x through a feature vector, f of x. So the idea here is um, for the this phi of x, this feature vector, the idea is that it captures the dominant nonlinearities in the function that you want to approximate so that you can use a j hat function that's simple, for example, linear. Okay, this is an example of a linear feature-based architecture. There is nonlinear dependence on X, but the nonlinearities come through the features. And the features are supposed to capture the dominant ups and downs, the nonlinear, what we want to approximate. And these features are weighted linearly, and we want to find the weights of the features. Of course, the premise here is that um, the, that you have good features. Somehow you have good features. So that linearly weigh, weighing them gives you adequate results. Now in problems where you don't have good features, this beast comes along, okay, to help you. Uh, it's formidable, but it works, okay? It, and it works and there are software for training it. Okay, so this is, a neural network involving a single nonlinear stage and 
a single linear stage. A deep neural network is one that involves a concatenation of these linear and nonlinear layers. At the very end, just before the output is produced, we have these functions from the last nonlinear layer, which are viewed as features. So this entire stuff that happens before is used to, to give you these quantities, which are then linearly weighted to produce a cost approximation. So training a neural network involves both discovering the features and finding the coefficients that weigh them. Okay, That's a major convenience. If you know some features already, you can still add them to this structure because the state uh, is first has to be encoded in a way that makes sense for the neural network. And part of this encoding may involve handcrafted features that you may know that are useful uh, in the given context. Still, there are, there are, there are, there are issues to deal with uh, in, uh, in approximating functions with a neural network. You have the training issue. You have pairs of states and approximations that you match to data. You have a big nonlinear regression problem involving zillions of weights. And you have to solve that problem. And the method of choice is incremental gradient method, or gradient descent, as it's called. Stochastic gradient descent. It is neither stochastic and it's neither descent, but people call it stochastic gradient descent. I prefer the method incremental gradient. It's not, it doesn't decrease the cost function at every step, but it has theory, solid theory behind it, which we have covered in this class. We spent quite a bit of time talking about various incremental methods. These methods are also called backpropagation. And the term backpropagation is used very loosely in, in reinforcement learning. People talk about backpropagation networks. But the original use of the term backpropagation had to do with a special type of computation of the gradient of the quadratic training objective with respect to these parameters. It turns out that you can compute this gradient going backwards through the layers. And uh, this is basically the chain rule that you're using. Backpropagation is just an intelligent way of using the chain rule to calculate the gradients that you need for the training problem. Gradients of cost with respect to the Vs, the As, and the Bs here. OK. Deep neural networks. It's a big industry these days. Um, and, um, and they have scored some major successes in important contexts. You can't argue with that success. It's, uh, it's, uh, they are here to stay. People are going to be able to try them. Uh, they were tried in the early days of neural networks, like the 90s. And they were found to be not a big thing, because uh, perhaps because we didn't have as much computing power in those days. The problem is much more difficult, many more weights with deep neural networks. You need a lot more computation power. And we have this computation power now. So within the last 10 years, people have been able to, to have some breakthrough successes in important contexts. Um, in, um, in speech processing, uh, image processing, and also, if you look at alpha 0, alpha 0 uses deep a deep neural network. So deep neural networks, they're not different. They're just deeper, OK? That's, that's all. And, and uh, they are governed by the same approximation guarantees than the shallow neural networks, which uh, is the universal approximation theorem that says that if you, you can approximate arbitrarily closely any conceivable function that you might want you might encounter by using a sufficiently large number of weights, not layers, weights. A single layer, linear and nonlinear, is sufficient to calculate arbitrarily closely any, um, any target function. However, with deep neural networks, you may be able to structure the layers a little bit more cleverly. 
and uh, use fewer weights in the end to get the same degree of approximation. So um, a lot of people are doing theoretical research here. And uh, I'm looking into the literature to see for exciting, interesting, and insightful results. But I haven't found any that I can report to you. <laughs> OK. Uh, let me just pause the video here. This, vi this, this lecture was given two years ago. And I was indeed looking for literature uh, that would explain the, um, the, the success of uh, uh, deep neural networks. Uh, people were arguing for very, from various points of view, but it seems that uh, the most likely reason, at least that analysis can support, why deep neural networks have, are doing well is over parameterization, more parameters than data, okay? It used to be the conventional wisdom that if you use over parameterization, then you run the risk of uh, getting not very good results. But people have shown that with enough sufficiently large number of uh, weights, then you can get a benefit from over parameterization that um, in a way that avoids the so-called overfitting problem, which is a well-known problem in machine learning. And um, uh, so I think that uh, the theory is gravitating towards this point of view. There are important contributions. I think when I gave uh, in our class earlier, I mentioned over parameterization as being an important uh, characteristic of deep neural networks because of the large number of layers, they have a lot more weights. And that seems to be the, the determinant of their success in practice. So anyway, I just wanted to interject here the latest, as you can see, uh, the field is moving very rapidly and important issues are being, are, are addressed, uh, are addressed very, very often uh, at this stage. So I'm going to go back to the video now. Uh, maybe that's, uh, that's not a fair statement, but uh, that's uh, my state of the art anyway. Um, okay, so we have nonlinear architectures. This is a typical example. There are other nonlinear architectures. Um, for example, radial basis functions is one, where the basis functions are Gaussian looking functions, and the parameters are the height and the center of the, of, and the variance of, and, and the center of this uh, Gaussian looking function. And um, uh, you can use um, a, a linearly weighted sum of these radial basis functions to provide an approximation architecture and try to train it. These are also useful in a number of uh, interesting contexts. A neural network is what's called a global architecture. If you, choose, if you change one weight, then the whole function is going to change. Radial basis functions, if you change one weight, only the function is going to change only in some local way, not globally. OK. Yeah. Um, OK, I haven't gotten into that. I'm going to get into it in the next two slides. But generally speaking, uh, the data is you need pairs of x's and the function that you want to approximate. You want to approximate some target function, some j's of x, let's say. What you need is pairs of x's and j's of x's. And then you fit them, you fit the neural network to these pairs. That's where the data comes from. And now let's look at how they can be used in the context of dynamic programming. So this is finite horizon, sequential dynamic programming approximation. Uh, we also refer to this as fitted value iteration. And, uh, and uh, you do a parametric approximation with a neural network, some other architecture, at every stage, starting from the end. You start at n, and then sequentially train going backwards. You first train a parametric architecture for j n minus 1, then for j n minus 2, j n minus 3, and so on. Generally, given a cost-to-go approximation j tilde of k plus 1, 
you use one step look ahead to calculate state cost pairs, okay? So you have J tilde K plus one, you generate a large number of states here, you do this minimization, which could be a big thing, and uh, you calculate this number. So now you have a state and cost pair, okay? And you collect all those, and you train an architecture, J tilde of K, on this training set. In particular, you do it by least squares regression plus a regularization term. So again, we have J tilde K plus one. We generate a training set of sample states. We calculate this number here for each one of them, and we do this minimization. And we go backwards from N to N minus one, N minus two, all the way to the end, and we obtain J tildes for every stage. And we use this for one step look ahead to calculate an optimal, uh, a suboptimal policy. Okay, so is this, uh, this context clear? Okay, the difficulty here is that we have to compute an expectation and a minimization. And uh, to compute this expectation, we pretty much need a model, okay? If you want to implement this, this, this procedure in a model-free fashion, it's not easy because of this expectation. The alternative is to use Q factors where you train sequentially Q factor approximations starting from the end and going back to the beginning by using this Q factor approximation formula. So you generate Q tilde of n, n to obtain Q tilde of n minus one. You generate the Q tilde n minus two then using the corresponding formula and you go backwards and here's the big difference. Here, this formula that you want to use to generate Q-factor samples involves expected value of a minimum. The preceding formula had a minimum of expected value. You can sample expected value of minimum by generating samples of this minimum, basically, and averaging them, but you cannot sample min of expected value. It's a simple mathematical trick, and it accounts for the use of Q factors versus cost approximations, okay? So how do I do the sequential Q factor approximation? I, I have Q tilde K plus one, and I generate state control pairs and corresponding samples of this thing here. Not the expected value, but a sample of this inside the brace. So I have these pairs. There's no need to compute an expected value. And then, and then I do my training using this data. I don't need a model to calculate a sample of this expression. It's sufficient to have a simulator that generates state control pairs and corresponding costs and corresponding next states. All of this is sufficient to obtain samples of this Q factor that you can use in least squares regression. And now given the, a, an approximation of the Q factor, the one step look ahead is obtained by minimizing this expression. So this is an extra bonus now. This minimization becomes easy. If you have a neural network here that um, generates these Q factors and you have a finite number of controls, you have your neural network generate these things and minimize. It's much simpler to implement online. Okay, so we looked at um, parametric approximations and their use in the context of finite horizon dynamic programming problems with fitted value iteration, and then we fitted, fitted Q factor uh, iteration, or fitted Q learning, if you'd like to call it that. 
So now we are done with finite horizon, and we're going to go into infinite horizon with the view that a lot of the methods that we have developed for this context can be applied to this context. For example, rollout, uh, parametric architectures, and so on can be applied within this context. But infinite horizon problems require some mathematics, okay? But they, they, they have some, some theory associated with them that, that's more substantive than the theory for finite horizon problems. The theory for finite horizon problems is essentially trivial, okay? There's only one algorithm, dynamic programming algorithm. The rest is, is various ways of working with this algorithm. Here we have, we have um, first of all, need to impose some assumptions. And we have assumed a finite number of states, one up to n. We have changed our notation. We used i and j for states rather than x, rather than x's. We have used we are using transition probabilities between states uh, rather than dynamic system equations, and uh, we have assumed a discount factor alpha, and uh, in the discounted version of the problem, you try to minimize the the expected discounted cost over an infinite number of stages. And um, um, we also considered stochastic shortest path problems that involve a goal state, a cost-free and absorbing state. And um, uh, again, a finite number of states. We also assume that every policy will lead to the goal state with probability one. Um, so we. These two problems have very similar theory, and we're going to focus on discounted problems. We're not going to say anything about, about uh, stochastic shortest path problems um, under the assumptions that I have made of all policies reaching the destination, reaching the, the goal state with probability one. Let me also, as a warning, I mentioned earlier in the course, once you deviate from this simple framework, there are all sorts of complications that arise, theoretical complications. These three results that I'm going to discuss now that we have been operating with do not hold anymore because there are all sorts of, uh, of anomalies. There is theory for them, but it's much more complicated. And moreover, the application of approximation methods to problems that are more complicated than this discounted and stochastic shortest path problems is, is more difficult. Approximation is much more difficult. And also, people have not done it. It's a subject for research at this point in, in many ways. OK, so we're going to stick with this easy case for this review, because that's the only case we have covered. And the first result says that value iteration converges from any initial conditions. In particular, value iteration starts from some J0 vector of n scalar components and generates um, and generates a sequence of vectors, J0, J1, J2, and so on, using this formula. And, uh, and the generating sequence has the property that is guaranteed to converge to J star for every I, every state, and every initial condition. Bellman's equation, the optimal cost function, which is a vector here, satisfies this equation. This equation really is a limit of this equation as k goes to infinity. And it is satisfied uniquely by j star. Okay. And the third is an optimality condition that says that a stationary policy is optimal if and only if for every state i, nu sub i attains the minimum in this equation. It's an if and only if condition. So these are the three standard results for exact discounted dynamic programming problems. And um, the, an important algorithm, perhaps the most important algorithm for the, from, from the point of view of approximations, is policy iteration, where we generate a sequence of policies starting from some initial policy. Uh, we evaluate it by calculating the corresponding cost. And then we generate an improved policy by one step look ahead. And uh, here's, 
hear the details. Given the current policy in UK, we first evaluated to compute these costs of the policy for every state by solving this Bellman equation, which is linear. This is the Bellman equation that corresponds to the policy in UK. It has a unique solution. The unique solution is this. And it's a linear equation. You could solve it by matrix inversion, but often you want to solve it by iteration, like a value iteration. Um, and the policy improvement phase calculates the new policy by one step look ahead. And the theoretical properties of policy iteration are very strong. Uh, it generates a sequence of better and better policies, strictly better policies, and stops, finds the optimal policy in a finite number of steps. And there are several variations of policy iteration. There's an optimistic version that uses value iteration to approximate the solution of this policy evaluation equation with a finite number of value iterations. Okay, that's optimistic. That's called optimistic. Multi-step look-ahead version is one where instead of using one step look-ahead in the policy improvement, you use multi-step look-ahead, aiming for perhaps a better policy. Um, and all of these, all of these versions have the same solid guarantees of convergence of the, of the, of the standard policy iteration method. So this method has a strong starting point, at least for exact problems, and it's a prime candidate for approximation. And the approximation happens in this box here. We generate a sequence of policies by first evaluating, then improving, and then going back again. And this improvement is done by approximation. In particular, we may use a parametric approximation method uh, to approximate the solution of the Bellman equation corresponding to that policy. So let's call J tildes of mu i and r the parametric architecture. r is the parameter vector. This could be a linear feature-based architecture, or it could be something more complicated, like a neural network. And what we do is we generate data corresponding to this policy. And one possibility is to use least squares regression to obtain the parameter that specifies the policy, the, 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 the policy evaluation box. So we generate a sample set of states and a sample set of costs associated to <coughs> this state. How do we do that? Well, one possibility is to simply run the system from the current state forward using the policy and collecting the costs. Um, in particular, we may simulate an n-step trajectory starting at i sub s using mu and then perhaps adding a terminal cost approximation after the end steps to obtain a cost sample. And uh, we put this all together into a nonlinear regression, and that's how we do this approximate uh, policy evaluation. There are, in the literature, you'll find many different methods for doing this policy evaluation, and particularly the temporal difference methods. The class of temporal difference methods are, uh, are You'll see them very frequently in the literature. There are a number of reasons for this. These temporal difference methods of these examples are TD lambda, LSTD lambda, LSPE lambda. Lambda is a certain parameter by which you, you structure this least squared regression. And, um, and, and they, they are more sophisticated methods mathematically. They were introduced early on in, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, and um, they have interesting theory. You can prove things about them, and that attracted theoreticians like myself, OK, um, to do work here. That doesn't mean that these methods work, work well, OK? They're just more interesting. And people have worked a lot in them, and there's a lot of, of culture in the reinforcement learning that revolves around temporal differences. People think of them, they're fundamental to learning, quote, unquote. 
Um, okay. Some people believe that, and uh, but there's no clear. Uh, the term fundamental is hard to justify anyway, <laughs> but uh, it's not clear why they are fundamental and why they are not just just particular formulas to do computation. Okay. Anyway, um, these methods here tend to be more solid because these methods require have interesting mathematical analysis, but they also involve significant assumptions for their convergence. They can be more fragile than this type of method here. And, um, and uh, we did not spend too much time on these, but if you look at your notes, you'll see, you'll see some high-level discussion of these methods that also points the way to the literature that you may want to read to understand these methods better and at the same time be able to read a lot of literature that you'll find in journals uh, at the current state of the art. Okay, so these are nice methods, interesting, and uh, uh, I think that as new methods come along, it's important to compare them with these. They sort of form a benchmark and uh, uh, they have scored quite a few successes uh, so far. Okay, so now let's focus on this method here. Remember that we have state cost pairs and, um, and uh, we want to fit them uh, to an approximation architecture. Uh, in the process of generating these sample pairs, there are a number of issues to consider. First of all, there's the training problem, solving this problem here. Uh, you can solve this problem by an incremental gradient type of method. And this is the gradient. And this is the gradient of the, actually, there should be a mu here, OK? This is the gradient of the approximation architecture obtained by backpropagation in the case of, of neural networks. Um, then there is, um, there is um, the trick of using trajectory reuse. Remember, here we have state and cost pairs corresponding to a trajectory starting at this i sub s. Now, this trajectory goes forward for a potentially large number of steps. And as you generate it, in fact, you're generating cost samples for starting at every one of those states. So you have one cost sample going from here to here, another cost sample going from here to here, and so on. So you can use the tail portions of the trajectory to generate more samples. This is called trajectory use. It's an important technique because it saves a lot of computation. There is the issue of exploration. When you're evaluating a certain policy with trajectory use, you generate many cost samples that start from states that are not frequently visited by you. When you generate these trajectories, you tend to go through states that are preferred by new. So there's a certain bias towards those states. And if you want to have um, the cost of uh, all states being represented well in the least squares objective, you need to introduce some additional samples that explore the state space more widely. It's a major issue in approximate policy duration. Um, then, how long should these trajectories be? As the, long, as the length increases, then you get better, better cost samples, more accurate samples. But then the samples are more noisy because the more random costs that you add, the more variance the costs have. Um, so we discussed this a little bit, and we also discussed error bounds for the, the difference between the final policy that you obtain by approximate policy duration and the optimal cost function J star. And one of the most important bounds is that the approximate policy duration method tends to converge monotonically in the beginning and then converges to some error zone with that error zone depending on the quality of, 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 of uh, policy evaluation. It's a qualitative result, but it's interesting because 
practical approximate policy direction exhibits this type of behavior. OK. So uh, let me pause the video here. It's a long lecture. We haven't taken a break. Uh, the other reason I want to stop the video is for you to give a chance to ask questions. So we'll take a 10 minute break in which I invite you. Your, 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 it's a working break. I invite you to think about things that uh, you'd like to ask and uh, that are that uh, or things that we should have covered and perhaps we haven't. And uh, so let me first uh, ask question, uh, ask, uh, offer you the opportunity to ask questions of the preceding training um, um, uh, portion of the, of the video and also on, on, on the lecture so far. Are there any questions? And uh, uh, right now, Yeah, for the um, for the fitted Q value iteration. So we have bias that's being introduced by each time we fit a network on QI using the old network to update the the new one. Um, is doing a multi-step look ahead when collecting the training set uh, the only effective way we can reduce bias, or is there other ways that we can effectively reduce bias? Okay, I'm not sure whether it would reduce bias by multi-step look ahead. Multi-step look ahead is extremely time consuming. And to do it at every step, going n steps backwards is some tall order. As it, as it happens, fit value iteration is already a very time consuming process. Uh, remember that n neural networks here that you fit, right? Um, there is the issue also of error over time, whether it builds up to the point where it leads to instabilities. Other ways, other ways, I don't know, use another method. Um, I'm not uh, too fond of this um, uh, fitted value iteration, but uh, because it's very simple to understand and very simple to implement, people have used it a lot. It's time consuming, but simple to implement. So I don't know if this answers your question. I don't really have a satisfactory answer. No, yeah, that, that answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so the time is 6.32 in Arizona and uh, we'll convene in 10 minutes. That's 6.42. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, so I'm going to restart the video. Well, one second, Professor. I, I was turning my mic on, sorry. Okay. So um, has there been any usage of rollout as a sort of soft start to deterministic IP or MIP problems? IP or MIP? So integer programming. So integer has there been any cases where they use it for a, a way to start the branch in brown bound to, to as a, a potential candidate for a feasible solution to start cutting trees? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, rollout is a cheap way to do branch and bound. You cut through quickly through the branch and bound tree and you get a good solution, um, oftentimes much better than what you would get with a lot of branch and bound starting from scratch. Uh, it's a uh, rollout for an integer programming problem like the combinatorial problems that we have discussed. We'll cut through the branch and bound tree and in an effective way and give you a very good solution. Now, of course, you can always improve a very good solution. And I'm not sure, I, I don't know that people have done that, but I, I would not be surprised at all if it, if it, can, if it can be done. Um, and um, that's true for integer programming problems. And it's also true for mixed integer programming problems, provided you can deal with the continuous variables effectively in rollout. So that answers that my right? question. Thank you. Okay, good. 
Any other questions? Is this the general questions? Yeah, general questions. Okay. Yeah, that high level question. Um, I was wondering what you see as the most promising directions in the field towards achieving more sample efficient methods for reinforcement learning. Um, okay. Um, that's indeed a very general question and it's hard to answer because there are so many irons in the fire at present and there are so many cultures involved in this field. Okay, the field is just vast. People are going to be working in reinforcement learning for years and years to come and they're going to be working from different angles. So there are people like uh, artificial intelligence people who are discovering new ways to formulate their problems uh, in planning, all kinds, of, just about anything can be formulated as a reinforcement learning, sequential optimization problem. If you try hard enough, you can do it. And uh, there are lots of people in artificial intelligence, a vast, uh, a vast uh, number of people, a vast population that uh, are working in uh, various, uh, uh, various aspects of these problems. Uh, then there is robotics, which, uh, okay, the robotics people are half control, <laughs> half artificial intelligence, depending on uh, the, the training that they have received or the culture in which they live. There are all sorts of things there. And um, there is um, there's control people, um, MPC people, and there is uh, the operations research people who actually have been slow in waking up to reinforcement learning but there's an awful lot of opportunity, like the mixed energy programming type of combinatorial problems that the previous questioner uh, brought up. And then there are people in economics that are, uh, that are waking up to reinforcement learning. Uh, people in finance use reinforcement learning uh, already, and uh, there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, so, there are application specific directions or discipline specific directions. And there are general directions, like for example, multi-agent problems. Uh, they have find applications in all kinds, in, in, in a great many different application fields, but there are also generic issues to be resolved, like what we have tried to do with uh, agent by agent uh, policy iteration or age by agent rollout and signaling and so on. These are new directions. And uh, I'm sure that uh, there will be a lot of work in that uh, area. There will be a lot of uh, work on parallel computation in the context of, um, of uh, reinforcement learning because there are so many opportunities for parallelism. And there are some opportunities, that a lot of opportunities for blind parallelism, uh, you know, just parallelized Monte Carlo simulation very effective, but not very, I mean, does not require much ingenuity to apply it. But there are also intelligent, uh, intelligent choices in, uh, in distributed uh, reinforcement learning, asynchronous computation, the use of multiple neural networks uh, that communicate with each other, special types of neural networks. There's all sorts of opportunities for research. And moreover, it's the way of the future distributed computation, parallel computation is the way of the future. It's already very plentifully available. It's going to be even more so. And it's what is needed to address the large scale uh, computations that are necessary with the methods that we have today. Okay, <laughs> I've talked a lot. I may have forgotten some, some directions and uh, if you ask somebody else, some other work in the field, you'll probably find a few other ones. But that's what comes to mind. Is there something that you have in mind? Um, no, thank you. Well, yeah, the thing, the main thing that I've been thinking about that we haven't gone over in this course is uh, what I see in the literature is re referred to as model-based reinforcement learning. So I guess just trading off between when we don't have dynamics of the environment using a model free algorithms versus algorithms which try to learn the dynamics and reward model of the environment and then use that approximated model for planning. Yeah, uh, it seems yeah. very it's, difficult. I think but... you asked me a question earlier about the use of system identification. Yeah, in, uh, in constructing models as you control the system. 
that's the issue. You can always construct models and then model now, control later, okay? Or model in the background as you control. This is the approach that we have taken in this course. Uh, the simultaneous modeling and control, whereby you use control signals to stimulate or to enhance the quality of identification. This is a far more difficult problem to do it well. It's referred to as the dual control problem in, 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 in stochastic control. It's an ancient problem that dates to the 60s. And uh, we have not covered that. You're absolutely right. And moreover, I have no suggestions in this direction. Just the difficulty of this problem just overwhelms me. And uh, I know that people are working in this area, but I haven't followed the literature very closely. So that's where I am with respect to this problem. And perhaps if you have some specific questions about literature, because you said there are a lot, there's a lot of literature on model-based uh, reinforcement learning, uh, then you know you can bring them. You can send me email. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else that uh, we have not covered? I think we have not covered so much, particularly because in this course, uh, we took uh, a very a targeted approach towards rollout and policy iteration, and also this multi-agent stuff and distributed computation stuff. Uh, so it, this was not a full-fledged, broad reinforcement learning course. Uh, I think the 2019 offering of the course was much more, was much broader, considerably broader. This one was a more targeted research oriented version of the course. So there's a lot that we have not covered. Um, and uh, and uh, there will be other offerings of the course in the future. So we'll cover more. Okay, so now I'm going to return to the video to cover a policy approximation in policy space and uh, we still have uh, about uh, about 25 minutes of video. Okay. So let's switch now to approximation in policy space for infinite horizon problems. We parameterize stationary policies with a parameter vector r. We denote them by mu of r, and each r defines a policy. And uh, there are various ways of doing parametrization. We'll discuss some of them uh, later, possibly using a neural network, possibly using features that are specific to a particular practical context. And uh, the idea is to choose R, choose a policy within this parametric class that optimizes some measure of performance. And I have here five contexts within which you might want to use approximation in policy space. Problems where there are natural policy parametrizations, like I gave the supply chain example, where uh, there are parametrizations of policies that recommend themselves through simpler problems, simpler optimizations, like this SS policies or up to inventory ordering policies and so on. Um, there are problems which have natural value parametrization, but you can use a good policy training method for them. And the Tetris, the Tetris problem that I discuss is in this category. There are nice features that provide good and natural value parametrizations, but when it comes to training, it turns out that policy training methods have worked better than value training methods. We mentioned approximation in policy space on top of approximation in value space um, to overcome some of the uh, difficulty with, uh, with not having transition probabilities, not having a model. Uh, learning from a software or a human expert. Suppose you have a human expert that, that knows how to, to choose to make good decisions. Then you may try to emulate his decision-making process by training a policy to match his decisions. Finally, there are problems where you have unconventional information structures where conventional dynamic programming breaks down. 
you just you, approximation in value space does not make sense because dynamic programming cannot be applied to these problems. Still, problems like that may admit a policy parameterization. And one example I have in mind is multi-agent systems with local information not shared by other agents. Making decisions on the basis of their information, they have feedback, their policies can be parameterized, but the feedback that they have is not shared by other agents, at least not at the current time. It may be shared with some delay. Then you can't write a dynamic programming equation, it turns out, and you have to resort to approximation in policy space. Not much is known about about methods of this kind, but there are certainly, uh, certainly uh, possibilities. OK. So let me go into the cross-entropy method for approximation in policy space. Um, this, um, here we introduce a, a cost optimization objective, and we find uh, a parameter vector that minimizes the corresponding this, this objective. The framework is what you see here, a system with cost at each stage generating uh, a state which is fed back into the controller, which is a parametric controller, and uh, generates a control. And uh, each parameter vector defines a stationary policy with its components. And for a given initial state, you may consider the cost associated with R, the controller corresponding to R, and, um, and minim for a given initial state, and then find the parameter vector that minimizes this cost. Uh, you may not know the exact initial state, but instead you may have a probability distribution over initial states. So in this case, you may want to minimize the expected value, um, expected value over the probability distributions according to some, uh, some arbitrarily chosen distribution. This is an objective that can be minimized over R. Now, this cost function or this cost function, they are ugly in the, in the sense that it's very hard to calculate gradients of these expressions here. And uh, however, a random search method uh, does not have this type of difficulty. The random search method does not require gradients. So here's the, the cross-entropy method, which has scored some successes. And what it does is um, generates a sequence of parameter vectors aiming for, for convergence to an optimal parameter vector. And the cost function is this cost I gave in the preceding slide. So at the current iterate RK, we construct some kind of an ellipsoid centered at RK. And then we generate a number of random samples in the space of R, in the parameter space. And these samples are the black ones and the green ones. And we select a set of green samples that have low cost. We can evaluate the cost corresponding to each sample. We don't need gradients for that. We can evaluate it. And we take a subset of low cost samples. How you do that, there are heuristic methods, some of them analytically motivated. Then we can calculate the sample mean of these accepted samples. And that's the next point, RK plus 1. And now you need to calculate an ellipse within which you're going to sample at the next step. And what you do is um, you construct some kind of a sample covariance matrix of the accepted samples, which sort of captures the, the shape of the location of the locations of these, um, of these green points. And then you perhaps enlarge it. This is sort of a step size parameter. And you generate a new ellipse within which you sample some more. And then pick out the, the low cost samples from here and keep on going. It's uh, very simple. It's well suited for parallel computation. All sampling methods are, are well suited for parallel computation. And it resembles a gradient method because it tends to go from high cost parameters to low cost parameters. It moves in the general direction of the gradient. So like a stochastic gradient, you might call it. 
it is also model free, okay? Because the costs here can be calculated by, by simulation, some kind of a, uh, some model free method. You, you can calculate costs in any way that uh, you, that, that, that's possible. It doesn't need, you don't need to have a model. A simulator will do. So it has its advantages. It has limited convergence rate guarantees, but there have been successes and uh, the implementation is simple. So it's a method that has attracted serious attention. Okay, aggregation. I spent two, the last two lectures on aggregation. There are reasons so I'm not going to say too much about it. Uh, you remember the, the, the premise. Uh, we tried to form a problem of reduced dimension, reduced size. And one way to do it is to use features discretize the feature space in some kind of a regular partition and pick a representative state from each state of the partition. Uh, we use a, a feature mapping that maps original states into features and um, you consider for each representative state a footprint of original system states that map into the set of the partition corresponding to X. And then you form this composite optimization problem whereby from the representative states, you go up to the original system states using this disaggregation probabilities, then transition to original system states, and then down with some aggregation probabilities to the representative features. And you construct a composite system whose state space is this, Okay, it's bigger, but there's a, there's a composite Bellman equation that corresponds to that, which you can solve by simulation-based value duration and policy duration. So just some um, high-level comments about aggregation. It aims to approximate J star, not J mu of some policy. And it uh, doesn't uh, run into some fi fundamental limits that have to do with the power of the approximation architecture. You can get an arbitrarily close approximation to J star if you have a sufficient number of aggregate states or representative features. We made a distinction between representative feature schemes and their simpler special case of representative states. A representative state is just one of the ordinary states, okay? A representative feature corresponds to multiple states. And the representative state schemes are less powerful but easier to implement and uh, require less computation. There are methods, value iteration policy, iteration methods for solving the aggregate problem. And finally, I talked about spatio-temporal aggregation, which uh, involves compression of states and compression of time periods to obtain simpler problems. Okay. So I have a couple of slides more. We've reached uh, the end of the review. And uh, do you have any questions, by the way, um, on any topic that we have covered or we have not got covered and you would like to know how it connects? Any questions? Yeah. Can you rephrase your question? Uh, I can try. Uh, so if I'm thinking about feature-based approximations, and if I have multiple original states that would have the same features, yes. it seems like they get smushed down into one state, which is yes. basically aggregation. So is it just aggregation at that point, or do I need to avoid having the same original states with the same feature vectors? Yeah, in, in all methods involving features, there's a general guiding principle that states that are, um, that you choose features so that 
states with similar features have similar costs. So when you group states that have roughly the same feature, you're grouping states that have a similar J star. And that, uh, that tends to affect the approximation much less. But then it's, it's just like in aggregation, you're trying to find aggregate states where the original states have the same cost approximately as well. Yeah. So they're really, are they just basically the same thing? The guiding principle is the same, yeah. Yeah, pretty much the same. It's just that the method for using the features to generate J tildes is different. In aggregation, it's a different uh, type of calculation than in, for neural network approximations. So, yeah. That was one distinction that you made in the video I was looking at in the aggregation lectures about the uh, aggregation, state aggregation uh, versus the feature-based aggregation. Uh, one of them was one-to-one, -one and the other one, I couldn't really understand uh, the comment. Uh, um, yeah, let me go to the previous slide. Okay. Representative features map from X to a number of possible states with probabilities. However, representative states are just, this, are just common states, so they map to only one. A representative state maps into itself. So that's why it's a special case. And also, what happens is that the aggregate problem solution becomes much simpler, because you can just confine it to these. OK, that's, uh, that's the dis distinction. And uh, however, of course. I think I was thinking about representatives features OK, maybe we can talk about it then. Okay. OK. So let's, um, OK, concluding remarks. Uh, words of caution. I have words of caution and words of optimism. And I'll switch between the two, and sometimes I do it unconsciously. OK, words of caution. They are challenging approximation issues in all approaches. All methods are difficult. No, there's no guarantee that any one method will work for all or most problems. There's no foolproof method. And the thing to do here is to have a toolbox of multiple methods and try to find the good candidates to apply on a given problem, challenging problem. OK. Um, in order to select features, you need to have some domain-specific knowledge. You need to understand your problem, to understand what, is, what should be good features for the given problem. You may need to look at simpler versions of that problem to get insight and so on. So this cannot be, cannot be packaged, OK? You, you, have to, you have to have some understanding to your problem in order to implement whatever method uh, you want to try. Training issues. They are not as reliable as they tell you, OK? They're just hard. Uh, and uh, you need to play with parameters. Uh, a nice thing is that neural network software have become available, like uh, what's called the uh, tensor, uh, TensorFlow, TensorFlow. So it's good to have this, this, uh, this, this software, but that doesn't mean that if you put your problem in there, you're going to, it's, things are going to work. To begin with, you have to choose various parameters. How many layers are you going to use? How many units you're going to use in each layer? What structure you're going to use? All of this, you have to, it's, it involves trial and error, uh, let alone issues of step size, issues of um, of all sorts of gradient-related, local minima type of issues that can go, can, can, can cause you problems. Approximate policy duration involves oscillations, OK? How do you know, as the method oscillates, uh, which, one, which policy you're going to use in there, OK? And the oscillation may not be uniform. Like, for example, one policy may be better than another for some states, 
but not for others. Okay, so which one are you going to use? Um, exploration issues can be a big, big headache, okay, particularly with Q learning uh, in involving polystyration Q learning. How do you know in a challenging problem that you have succeeded? You have some policy that produces some results that make some sense. How do you know how they compare to the optimal or even where they are good or not? Okay. Um, if you have some, some insight into your problem, you may say that this cannot be good. Okay? Or you can say that looks like it's doing reasonable things that humans would do in a similar situation. But there are no good quantitative ways of recognizing success. There have been amazing successes in game contexts like chess. I continue to be amazed by the Alpha Zero program. I could never believe, to, never thought I'd live to see this kind of, of amazing, uh, amazing uh, chess program that would succeed in discovering new strategies to play the game of chess, a game of several hundred years, several hundred years old. However, in this game context, uh, the models are stable, okay? Uh, it's the same game uh, every time. And it's perfectly known. The rules are perfectly known. Moreover, in many of these games where there have been successes, there's a small number of controls. Like in chess, for example, there's a small number of moves. In Go and so on, all of these games involve a small number of controls. If you have an infinite number of controls, as you do in optimal control problems, then some of the method, methods that have been used in the, in the context of games, like Monte Carlo tree search, cannot be used anymore. Um, finally, problems with partial state information uh, remain a big challenge because of the infinite states belief uh, space. The, the belief space is infinite. And, uh, and uh, there's a big issue of size with these problems. OK, on the positive side, we have uh, massive computational power these days, and uh, including parallel computation, which is very well suited for doing sampling, Monte Carlo uh, simulation, and so on. Uh, finally, even though we are not assured of solution of very difficult problem, we at least have methods to try. So we can begin to address practical problems of incredible difficulty. So there's an exciting journey ahead in which I hope you will all be participants. Um, OK, so now let me. At the end of each course, particularly older, older faculty tend to give words of wisdom, OK? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have any words, words of wisdom. But I can give you some quotations, words of wisdom of others. Uh, first one is this. Uh, the book of the universe is written in the language of mathematics. Why is the, why is the world around us uh, written in mathematics. Why can it be explained by mathematics? To me, it's a great mystery. And it's a, an, a, an amazing opportunity to use human reasoning for understanding of what surrounds us. Um, so never lose sight that mathematics is at the bottom of everything, OK? OK, Chinese uh, wisdom from uh, two and a half uh, thousand years ago. Um, the word learning is part of reinforcement learning, and also it's being, it's being uh, used uh, in, uh, in the field in various different meanings. So let me tell you Confucius' uh, uh, meaning. First of all, you have to understand that this quotation uh, involves uh, thought, the ter term thought, learning and thought. In the language of Confucius, learning was roughly synonymous obtaining knowledge by reading, by apprenticeship, and so on. Thought relates to ideas, ideas on how to do things. So to read this quotation properly, you have to read it as uh, learning without ideas is labor lost. Ideas without learning 
is perilous, okay? So there is something connected to a subject uh, that you may consider. Okay, this is an ancient Greek quotation about learning through experience. A lot of, uh, a lot of the underpinnings of this field is learning through experience, experience with using various methods and also collecting experience through simulation, okay? Learning about some process by simulating it and observing it. So many arts have been discovered through practice empirically. Experience makes our life proceed deliberately, but inexperience unpredictably. Uh, it's one of the dialogues of Plato. It's attributed to Socrates. Socrates did not write anything. Plato <laughs> wrote for him. Okay, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, our field is, um, is whatever works, okay? <laughs> it's, um, uh, you may have theoretical methods that don't work and non-theoretical methods that do work. It doesn't matter whether it's white or black as long as it works. Okay, so now let me go into some more, a couple of more recent quotations about machine learning and artificial intelligence. There's a lot of enthusiasm about it, and rightly so, because the successes have been phenomenal. There's no question that artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to be very important in our, the world around us uh, in the near future. So here's a quotation. Machine learning is the new electricity. Andrew Eng is a, is a professor at Stanford. So this quotation has circulated widely, and uh, in his words, I believe, at least as reported by Google. Um, <laughs> electricity changed the way the world with, with how the world operated, and artificial intelligence is poised to do the same thing in the future. In many fields, transportation, manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare, and so on. Here's another quotation that also has become very well known um, by Ali Rahimi and Dan Reck whom I had the pleasure to have uh, as students in several of my classes at MIT. I know them very well. Um, and uh, this is a more skeptical assessment and says that, yes, we have a bright future ahead of us, but we don't understand the underpinnings of the field. Uh, we do not know why some algorithms work and others do not, nor do we have rigorous criteria for choosing one architecture over another. Just as in alchemy, you mix several ingredients, and sometimes you get something interesting, sometimes not, but even when you get a success, you don't know why it has worked, okay? And uh, they make the argument, there's an interesting video that has many, many, many hits, YouTube, that uh, you may want to, you may want to, uh, to listen to. Um, so there's a lot of things to learn, a lot of things to think about, but our course is over. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK, um, as you've heard, our course is over. <laughs> I want to thank you for your participation. I look forward to your projects. Um, we are going to have our project presentations in two weeks. There is no class uh, next week. Uh, your projects are due Sunday after next, uh, at the end of Sunday after next. Uh, let me correct here. Uh, the ones that I, I, that are research oriented and would like to be, and you would like to present them in the last lecture, you should send them to me before the end of Sunday next week so that I have a chance to look at them, give you suggestions and so on. Uh, the, the term papers themselves are due on the last day of uh, classes, which is in two weeks exactly. So I have any questions here. about your projects or about uh, the about uh, about uh, this uh, 
uh, this lecture or any other question, you can always uh, email me. The, the Sunday after next Sunday, you would need to hear from us about whether we want to present. And also we need to provide you with slides, I'm guessing, or? Um, a, a preliminary form of slides and write up. It doesn't have to be a complete thing, but enough for me to understand what you have done and be able to offer suggestions. Okay, thank you. Now, how long that would be, you may decide, okay? Uh, I have one question. Um, so giving the presentation is optional or highly recommended? What is your opinion? It's entirely optional. As I've mentioned in the past, it's entirely up to you. Uh, some students, uh, I mean, it may happen. I'm not sure it's gonna happen to, to anybody in this particular class, but I've seen it before that some students have a certain vision of what they would like to do but they run out of time. They can't, uh, they can't finish what they've done. Then uh, I think it's important to recognize early on that uh, when to make a switch and do a presentation, uh, do, do a term project. I don't think it's so difficult because if once you have worked on a certain, on a certain project that's research oriented and you can easily turn around and turn and make it into a, some kind of a read and report type of term paper. Um, so I don't have any specific advice to give you, but the earlier you make a decision to do or not to do a research project, the better off you are. And you don't have to wait until Sunday to send me some, to send me an email, some material to ask for advice from me. You can send, you can, you can, you can try to connect with me at any time between now and Sunday next week. Okay, understood. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I think uh, we're done. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. And um, good luck with your term papers. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you.